If you're new to the Poets' Corner, just a few words about us. Um, we were founded in June of 2020. Myself and uh, my friend Catherine Seitz, uh, who due to some health constraints, she's no longer involved, but we were looking to create a community of writers and readers of poetry and short prose. As all of you, we were all sheltered in and community was so critical at that point in time. Today, you know, almost four years later, we have over 4,000 members from around the world. We host monthly readings such as the one you're about to listen to today. They're free, they're recorded, they're always available on our website after the event. We also feature some craft talks and there's one upcoming in February on exploring Rilke's poetry with the renowned scholar and translator of Rilke, <laughs> Mark Burroughs. That will be held on February 15th and you can register on the poetscorner.org. We charge a small fee for our craft talk series and that is usually the feedback we get, it's always a great value. A little later on, I want to tell you more about our 2024 chapbook competition. But first, I want to introduce a special guest who's joining us for today's program. The program today features the Nine Poets Collective, a group that came together in June of 2020 in that first awful spring of the pandemic on Zoom in a workshop on creating a poetry chapbook with an incredible teacher, Richard Blanco, who you probably know as Obama's inaugural poet, recipient of the Medal of Humanities Award from President Biden last year, the author of several poetry collections and his newest called Homeland of My Body that he'll be reading from here on the Poets' Corner on February 11th. Now, I know that Richard can only stay for a few minutes um, in our introductory comments um, because he has to go to a book signing at the Key West Literary Festival. So I'm gonna turn it over to Richard to say a few words first. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes? I can. Okay, great. I'm just, uh, I'm, not, I'm not usually, not usually do Zoom on phone, but, um, um, as you can tell, yes, from the palm tree in the background, I'm at Key West, um, but I couldn't, despite all that's going on here, I couldn't resist but pop in and, and just say, uh, just express my love and, and just, I don't know, so many great things about the experiences that with the nine, us nine, well, the 10 of us have had, right? <laughs> um, so um just to give you a little background i think some of some of what we talked about and some of some of the points that we sort of landed on was the idea of obsessions and how it's something that i firmly believe in and that you have to follow obsessions is another word perhaps for passion but also that one question of your life that you you know you may not answer completely but it's the pursuit and what's important in work right poems are not necessarily about finding a resolution but about finding some potential um some potential direction so i gotta say all my 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 nine poets like really took that to heart and it was so beautiful to watch them blossom in their work and and just and incredible how they put how they started seeing their work as a whole which is so beautiful too which is part of being a writer is not just writing one poem but seeing how your work adds up and is your obsession so I want to congratulate them all today. Um, on top of that, it's interesting being here at the at the at the Key West Literary uh, Festival. Uh, how important it is for us as writers, all of us, to sort of maintain community. It's the best way that we can experience uh, literature and especially poetry. It's also it's also the best way we can sort of continue to um, learn and grow as writers. And these nine have been like amazing. They still meet, if I'm not mistaken, to this day. Um, and so uh, I think it's some, a point that everyone should take to heart. Find your community, stick with your community, always, always connect with people because it makes us as writers feel alive and that we're not just sort of isolated at our desks. And being at this festival um, just reminds me of that over and over again. 
And I got to say that they're my community too. Um, you know, these aren't just students of mine. These are people that are now in my life and uh, whom I, in the course of the, in the course of our weeks together, um, months together, I've also learned a lot. Um, uh, keep that in mind, you know, just because you're, you're leading a workshop doesn't mean um, that we can't, we don't, we all have something to add uh, and regardless. And I've, I've learned from them as I imagine we've all learned from each other. Right. Um, and I'll say, um, I guess one last thing. Um, I never told them this, but like, <laughs> so one of my, one of my metaphors for, or one of my tropes for teaching now an undergraduate at Florida International University is I make, I don't think I told you guys, uh, but um, I make my students call me coach. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, in a way, you know, even though I was a workshop leader, I'm really a coach, right? I'm, I'm, I'm just leading you and, uh, or prodding you in a direction and watching what you're doing. But at the end of the day, as I tell my students, you got to get your butt out in the field and rehearse or, or practice and practice and practice. And you're going to get, you're going to, you're going to have some successes some failures, but it's the long game. And so I just wanted to share that because they are proof positive that that's, that's what you do. You just keep on getting out in the field and, and working and, and, and uh, practicing and moving forward and always on top of your game. So I wish you all, like, I can't wait. I, I still see many of you. Uh, so I can't wait to get back to Maine in the summer and connect with all of you again. And and also with another part of this great community is, you know, uh, the Poets Corner, which is which has gone viral almost, right? Like, that is community. We have to always remember that we're not writing on our own, that we're writing together in spirit. So... Um, Godspeed, and I wish I could stay for the entire uh, the entire uh, readings, but like Meg said, I got to do a book signing. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I couldn't resist not taking a moment to just touch base with all of you and and really just um, share share my sentiment and my love for all of you and for poetry. Okay, Coach, that was right. terrific. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Have a so good reading. Much. <laughs> yeah that that was great that it was so nice to have um to have Richard here with us because he started it all he offered this class through main media workshops and we all signed up and as Richard said that was you know June of 2020 and we've been meeting together ever since and we meet once a month and we'll talk more about this group and what that means to us um, after our reading today. But our nine poets will each read one poem and um, a piece. And I will introduce each of them uh, before they read. These poems are one of three poems that were published in a special section in a new literary magazine from Downey's Books called The Main Standard. The magazine will be out this spring. Um, you can pre-order your copy. I'll put a link in the chat later. Um, but uh, I recommend that you read it. But the special section is called Obsessions as Richard talked about, and each of us sent in some of the poems that we felt related to those topics that really, you know, speak to us to write about. And so, and they selected three from, from each of us. So we'll have time after the reading, we're each going to only read one, and then we'll have time to talk about our group, talk about the main standard, answer questions from the chat. And I think that's about all I want to say about that. But I'm going to say just a couple more words before we get started about um, things coming up on the Poets' Corner. As we said, Richard Blanco will be here reading from Homeland of My Body and talking to us about his work and his poetry path. Um, on February 11th. On Jan in January 
second, we opened our second chapbook competition. The 2024 chapbook competition will have submissions open until February 29th. Our judge this year will be the distinguished poet Marie Howe. And I, if you don't know her work, look it up. She's amazing. I'm so thrilled that she agreed to be our judge this year. Um, this year's competition is a collaboration between the Poets Corner and Toad Hall Editions, who will design, print, and publish the chapbook in an edition of 250. The winner receives a $1,000 prize and 20 copies of the published chapbook. There will be two honorable mentions that receive a $250 prize, and the actual winner announcement will take place at the Camden Festival of Poetry on May 18th. And that festival is live in person in Camden, Maine. If you can come, our keynote this year is Padre Gotuma, the Irish poet and peace activist. So you won't want to miss it if you're anywhere near Maine or can be in Maine in May. So I want, don't want to take any more time away from today's program. So let's begin. And in a few minutes, I'll put the order of reading up into the chat. But first, I want to introduce our first reader. Our first reader is Susan Tenney. Susan is an award-winning director, choreographer, as well as a poet. Her work in theater has appeared off-Broadway and in venues that include the Lincoln Center, among others. She's currently in development with a play, uh, a play, McCourt, which is based on the memoirs of the beloved Irish-American memoirist, Frank McCourt. And we can't wait till that comes live to the stage, but here today, we're going to hear her poetry. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Meg. And thank you, Richard. Um, the poem that I am sharing with you today is called The Roses. So I think I'm just going to present it to you. Um, here we go. The Roses. Beloved, your love, your spontaneity, out in search of a metaphor in early hours of this ordinary Saturday, returning with oranges and roses spread over the kitchen counter to greet my 10 o'clock eyes. You are mon petit prince. But loosening their cellophane negligees, their leaves fell off. All of them, plunk, plunked, plunk, plunk, like raindrops down, all but the red closed buds stuck on the ends of long stripped stems, looking like guilty greyhounds, embarrassed, wanting to slink away, silly and anemic, undressed but not sexy, sad, naked, ridiculous in the vase, your gift ruined. So, I complained about the roses. I did. I complained about the roses. I complained about all 24. Jumped in the car, hair uncombed, nightshirt and sweatpants, stormed into Whole Foods, walked right up to the flower man and said, my love, spontaneously this morning for the love of my life. Flower man, strange. I've never heard of such a thing. All the leaves falling off the roses? No, I'll have to speak to my district manager. Our roses come from Columbia, ma'am. Who knows what they do to them there? You have no receipt, ma'am. Yes, I know, and because you have no receipt, we cannot give you store credit. Oh, plunk, plunk, and plunk, plunk. Beloved, jelly bean. It's unexplainable. Shh, just unexplainable, like love itself. Thank you. Thank you. 
That was wonderful, Susan. I just love that poem. Thank you so much for sharing that today. Um, Pam is up next. Pam Burr-Smith has published short stories, essays, articles, and poems in various journals, as well as two poetry books, Heaven Jumping Woman from Moon Pie Press and Near Stars from Blackberry Books. After a career as a therapist, she's returning to her earlier career and love of painting. Pam. Thanks, Meg. Sometimes in a very boring, ordinary situation, something extraordinary happens. And that's what this poem is about. Late afternoon, Logan Airport, 2019. He sits one empty plastic seat away from me in a crowded corner off the airport hallway. And he starts to sing a love song in English in a beautiful, trained, unself-conscious manner at perfect volume, aimed, it seems, at me and everyone else. Full, round, lovely and wanted, his voice goes through us. When the song is over, its absence resounds. I wonder if I'm brave enough to talk to him as eyes closed, he leans back, catches his breath. Around us, everyone else is busy, pretending nothing happened, as though gorgeous opera graces this gritty corridor every day. And I know I have to, so normal voice, conversational, I ask, do you often sing in places like this? Your voice is beautiful. He thanks me and says, I only do it when someone near me talks loudly on a cell phone. It was such a heart-filled song. I know there's more to it than that. And then he adds, my wife died a few years ago and I traveled to see the grandkids. I look at the slumped nylon bags on the floor and the people punching fingers at handheld devices. Out the window, sleek silver planes wait in frigid air for the rush of feet, the stumble of travelers who are somewhere between here and where they want to be, and already so far from today's small miracle. Thank you so much, Pam. That, you know, the, it, it's what a small miracle. You know? <laughs> it's just such a beautiful poem. Thank you. Thanks. Our next reader will be Sean McCord. Sean was awarded the Academy of American Poets undergraduate prize during college. And writing has been a steady ingredient in her life. She recognizes the strong tie between being a writer-reader and teaching writing and reading. So please join me in welcoming Sean. Thank you very much, Meg. I wrote this poem, Letter to My First Daughter, after Richard said to me in a workshop, get into your gut. Feel it. So here I go. Letter to my first daughter. Oh, mighty one, you entered the world when the moon was a sliver, a simple sliver, bright on an August night. No birth is simple, though, so let's leave simplicity to the moon. Take a woman, your mother, me, in a mental stew of studies, juggling childhood philosophy, theory, and technique with ease, take this same woman, your mother, me, 
with no knowledge of how to love a brand new baby. Now, at a midwife, my expert other to my bulbous side, as I waddle around and around a sports field. Now add your faithful father, nervously navigating the highway to the hospital, as my guttural moans penetrated his concentration. As the doors slide open, I am instructed to lie on the stretcher because that's the law. This caused electrical shocks to reverberate through me, all of me. So I refused this law and order. Pain could be avoided if you, beautifully big in my belly, could hang down. So I, hands and knees on top of a sterile stretcher, was rolled while high off the ground to the room with a narrow window where, th where you, with a little help from my body's uncontrollable, unpredictable, hurtful heaving, you, in your time, through searing sensations that I wouldn't avoid, slid screaming into this world my world, now our world. That's when the moon sliver shone on you. Have you ever, maybe in a dream, entered a very important gathering of melodic conversation and laughter and realized everyone is speaking in words you don't understand? You're supposed to be happily engaged but you feel lost? You, dear one, with auburn curls and feisty swirls, stiff stance, caring glance, you made your points and you stood your ground. I had to learn how to hold you with no time for research, swing you with no time for theory, love you, no, really love you under the ever-changing moon, my mighty one. I'm still learning. Talk about from the gut, from the belly. Um, <laughs> wonderful poem. Thank you so much, Sean. Our next reader is John Paul Caponegro. John Paul's an internationally collected visual artist and a published author. He leads adventures in the wildest places on earth to help his participants creatively make deeper connections with nature and with themselves. I know that for a fact I've been on some adventures in photography with John Paul and his adventures in poetry are exciting to be a part of. You can view his TEDx and Google Talks on his website, johnpaulcaponegro.art slash poetry for his um, poems. So please join us in welcoming John Paul. Thank you, Meg. Um, I wrote this during our workshop at the height of COVID quarantine. And there were too many things to lament. I also lamented the diversion of attention and resources away from our mounting ecological crises. I read Silent Spring as a kid and watched it unfold in the Florida Everglades. It never really stopped. We've lost a third of songbirds in my lifetime. This poem's called, It's Raining Birds. It's raining birds, nose diving mid-flight, they're just falling out of the sky and hitting the ground. Their tiny songs are snapped from their necks and broken from their beaks. Flycatchers, swallows, warblers, no more. Reduced to feathers and bone with too little muscle and fat, they flew until they couldn't fly anymore. Rerouted from the tundra from melting Alaska and defrosting Canada, diverted off the fertile coasts of Washington 
Oregon, and California, now full of fire. Over the too thin to live Chihuahuan desert with too little touchdown and too little refueling, they never landed in their Central and South American wintering grounds. Grounded too soon, they became grounded permanently. Migration became starvation. The evidence is just sitting here, piling up at our feet. Soon, we won't be able to walk through all our trespasses. One by one, drop by drop, in hundreds, in thousands, in hundreds of thousands. The sea of birds joins the ocean of the dead, three billion full in 50 years and counting. Thank you, JP. Powerful poem and definitely one of your obsessions is what's happening to our earth. Thanks. Um, our next poet is Christina Hahn. Her love of poetry began with listening to a range of different poets and um, such as Diane Wachowski, Tim Lu, and others. After a career of editing, uh, teaching high school and college English, she relocated to Maine to make a life in which she might become a working poet. And I would say a life in which she is a working poet. Please join us in welcoming Chris Hahn. Thank you, Meg. Many of my poems navigate moments of self-reckoning. And the poem I'm about to read, Parker's piece, is titled For the Green in Cambridge, Cambridge England where the bus from Heathrow leaves passengers off. The speaker of the poem navigates a moment familiar to many women, that point where children have come of age and parents have moved on to the next realm. What next? Parker's piece for Stephen. Absence of tending others' needs leaves me brittle with the sensation that I am the remainder in a domestic subtraction problem. Then the cachet of your stint teaching Wordsworth at Cambridge pierces the notion that I am needed at home, residual. You ask me to come. Skittish traveling alone, I endure the long night's journey to London, the bus through Hamlet's long highways to arrive at Parker's Peace. You find me walking to the flat on Midsummer Green. In your smile, I know again the breathless early years. You want to inhabit this space together. I soften. Climbing the stairs to the second floor, excited as a new bride, we inspect the rooms together, then cross the green where community cattle graze to a pub on the River Cam. Exhausted, we return and go to bed. I listen as you tell me about the owls, especially the ones whose whoosh and deep hoot leads the parliament. The cool of night overcomes. Nestled into you, I sleep the sleep of one protected. Learn again to be your wife. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. We're all learning again, aren't we? Again and again. Ah, uh, next. Next is Audrey Minot Minotolo Lay. Um, Audrey teaches writing and literature at the University of Maine. Um, and her work has been published in Downey's Magazine. Um, where else? As well as other other um, magazines, I would say. Um, but most excitingly, her first novel called Gray Ledges will be published by Roman and Littlefield in 2025. So I'm excited to introduce Audrey. Thank you, Meg. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone, all of our nine poets. Um, 
I just want to share a little background about this poem. Um, during our workshop, Richard taught us the pentuum form of poetry, which consists of uh, four line stanzas um, within a poem. And it's, but it's got repeating lines throughout the poem. So it sort of creates an echo and uh, subtle shifts in meaning in, throughout the poem. So one day when I'm writing poetry, as I think we all do, we kind of go into a reverie and I was sitting and looking at a number of items on our porch and including um, Edna St. Vincent Millay's Renaissance, which was published in 1917 and um, so anyway, and I also was reading Thomas Edison's biography. So this is September evening, 1917. What is this hand knotted beige and rose wool rug and Edison's graphophone wax cylinder song playing on the warm summer porch as the gliding sofa sways back and forth, back and forth. What do Edison's graphophone song on the home model and Edna St. Vincent Millay's Renaissance have to do with this married couple's late summer porch evening and the wind whistling through the windows as the waves roll in? The sunset has left the Camden Hills black, their late summer porch looking out at the bay. He asks her to slow down as they sway back and forth on the glider and she scoffs as they settle into the truth of marriage husband and wife. The pace is not right, she says. The needle scrapes. You are my sunshine, wax cylinder song, spinning waves rolling in, hand knotted beige and rose wool rug, witness to the late summer evening graphophone song of love. White lace curtains billowing in the breeze, soft waves rolling in. You are my sunshine playing on the graphophone as they sway back and forth in the depth of marriage and leaving. For soon he will leave this place of home and the depth of marriage and the gliding sofa will remain. A marriage, though they haven't yet found the rhythm. The pace is not right, she says again, and the graphophone stops. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey, and thank you for giving us that little bit of background to the poem, a wonderful introduction an introduction to the pantoum if people aren't familiar with that form. So our next poet is Lucinda Ziesing. Lucinda is a writer, an actor, um, a producer, um, and what else? So many things, a painter also. Her paintings are in private and corporate collections. She taught on the theater faculty of Sarah Lawrence College and has appeared in productions in New York and elsewhere. She produces events that celebrate community. And of course, she writes poetry. So please welcome Lucinda Ziesing. Thank you, Meg. Um, this poem that I'm gonna read, I'm gonna pick up from the image that where Audrey left off, I'm going to take that gramophone needle and maybe take it back bef way before marriage, put it down and tell you a story. This was a time in my 20s when I lived in the mountains above Boulder, Colorado. She's gone. The fire in Four Mile Canyon scored the hillsides, then torrential rain. For eight days, the mountain fell down around her ankles. She's gone. Salina Junction swiped clean. Our cabin on the creek swept away. Splinters of her floating in Boulder Creek. Everyone wanted to live up there back then in the mountains above Boulder. Gold Hill was the diamond in the crown. A mining town of professors, hippies, and rednecks perched 8,500 feet up in the Rockies. The dogs walk the kids to school. Stephen Stills plays guitar for us. Bucky Filler plants geodesic domes on the edge of town. She wasn't much to look at. Our cabin, a dusty green asphalt shack. You hold your foot in the screen door on the way in to stop the slam. 
inside a temple of sound. Our bedroom's a music box whose lid never shuts, with windows hinged open to the creek. My boyfriend, Wick, panels our bedroom in barn boards with shelves for our books and LPs. Bob Dylan's Nashville skyline plays lay, lady, lay, lay across our big brass bed. I string colored beads on threads with crystal prisms that dangle from their ends. Macrame hung philodendrons thrive in the canyon's low light. So do I. The Vietnam War is raging. We believe we can change the world. I tack a white shawl embroidered in pink roses to the ceiling. It pillows over us. The breeze stirs the fringe. Our, our bodies pull together and pull me to planets beyond my solar system. After years of being told not to have desire, I want it all now. Charismatic and mercurial, his humor breaks me in half. Eyes the color of forget-me-nots, blue with a dot of yellow sorrow at the center. I think our love can stop a war. That was before he found cocaine. Each morning, he's navigated to a country with no name, and I can't reach him. By winter, ice, and the snow was up his nose. He wants other lovers. The geese migrate without me. I don't hear them call as they fly overhead. I lay on the cold bathroom floor that night, alone, miscarrying blood and the baby. I left the junction before winter could. Never got to sit naked in the creek in the heat of summer again. Never will. She's gone. Thank you. Thank you, Lucinda. That was a beautiful poem, beautiful memory. Took us back someplace very emotional. I'm very delighted to introduce as our next reader, Meg Weston. She is the co-founder and director of The Poet's Corner. Her poetry collection, Magma Intrusions, was published in 2023 by Kelsey Books, and an earlier chapbook, Letters from the White Queen, was self-published in 2020. Her poems have appeared in numerous literary magazines and anthologies. Thank you, Susan, for the introduction, and thank you, Lucinda, for that evocative poem I just brought me back to the 60s with the macrame and the beads in that incredible setting. So the poem I'm going to read really deals with two of my obsessions. Um, one is, is everything about volcanoes. You might see some of the art photographs and quilts and things behind me. It's been a lifelong obsession. And in um, 2002, I had the opportunity to take my then 15-year-old nephew to see a volcano in eruption. And that's my other obsession, I would say, family and those stories that, of, um, that create our lives. So this poem is called Stromboli. I remember getting off the ferry, the island of Stromboli, the last stop of the day, the black silhouette of the volcano rising above whitewashed houses on the slopes under a blue sky. I remember the crowds buzzing around me in a language I didn't know, unloading our luggage, helping our film crew with mountains of gear, stacking it on the pier, and the boat turned around to head back to Malazzo. The next day, the travel channel would film us after climbing the mountain, you, just 15, scrambling ahead of me, 
hiking up your baggy pants that looked as if they might fall to your knees. You would read the volcano rap song you wrote while the fireworks of eruption filled the evening sky behind you. I remember looking for you back when we were still on the pier, realizing you didn't get off the boat. Knowing you had fallen asleep, you always slept deeply. And trying to make myself understood at the ticket office where they spoke no English, finally rocking my arm saying Bambino and pointing to the rapidly disappearing boat. I remember the boat turned around and you had made friends with all the crew who were waving goodbye when you were returned to me. And we promised that neither of us would tell your father, my brother, although we both did. I remember 20 years later, you called me and said you would call every day if I wanted. And I said, no, once a week is enough if you promise to call. The next day you injected fentanyl into your arm and eclipsed into sleep. You kept that pro your promise that first week, returning in my dream, telling me you remembered to call, but you haven't come back again. And now all I can remember is all the times I had failed you and left you aboard the boat. Oh, I'm up again. <laughs> thank, thank you, Meg. Thank you, Meg. Incredible. Oh, thank you, Susan. It's sort of hard to transition. That's a... Uh, a personal poem, mm -hmm. um, but it's my love to introduce our next reader, uh, Chris Madsen. And Chris recently returned to Maine after what she calls an unfortunate hiatus in other parts of the country. She is a retired editor, but she keeps on writing. A novel and memoir sit unpublished in her desk but her poetry has seen publication in a dozen or so journals. And it's my pleasure to welcome Chris Madsen. Chris, you need to unmute yourself. I'm unmuted now. I very much enjoyed your poem, Meg. It uh, does dovetail very nicely into mine because I, I too am obsessed with uh, family and memories and reliving them again and again until I could finally find a way to put them down on paper. This, this poem is called To My Sister About Her Daughter. And it talks mostly about her daughter as a very young child this very young child now has three children of her own. To my sister about her daughter, we are all mostly memory with a bit of blood thrown in. It's the memory that moves us from one day to the next that keeps our feet moving forward, our minds looking backward, our hands clasped together that won't let us stop no matter what. At the birth of your first child, your face changed before my eyes. Even before you held your daughter, you saw oceans of possibilities in her eyes. You saw the world in the light beyond the stars. Your blood races through her and hasn't stopped since. When you were three years old and I was five, we rode a float in the sea. My hair in pigtails, yours in blonde ringlets, giggling in the waves at Aunt Reeks on Long Island. I can remember her laughing. At Barnegat Light, when she was three, her hair in blonde ringlets, your daughter threw herself at me in the shallow ocean waves, daring me to catch her. I caught my breath first, thinking she was you. 
we are all mostly memory with a bit of blood thrown in. At Christmas time, the lights from the tree glimmered in your eyes as you made the skaters on the tinfoil pond twirl round and round, and I held alpine races with the skiers on the cotton mountain at your side. In my backyard, I handed your daughter a sparkler, a simple sparkler, and before I could warn her to be careful of the sparks, I was starstruck by the sight of you. A three-year-old before me in the dark. We are all mostly memory with a bit of blood thrown in, but it's the memory that bonds us together. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I love that line. We are all mostly memory with a bit of blood thrown in. And the way your poem followed with that obsessions about family and how important that is, those memories. So now we are going to have a bit of a conversation amongst the nine of us. So I'll prompt with some questions and um, try to give you a little bit of information about our our poetry group, the main standard as a literary magazine, how that came about for us to be published, and other things. And then uh, feel free to put any questions you have in the chat at the same time, and I'll try to get to those as well. So I'm going to try to keep an eye on the chat and um, also um, prompt some people with a few questions for our conversation. So I'd like to start with Audrey, because I think this this publication was your idea, initiative, um, enthusiasm that said, you know, if we've been meeting for a while, and uh, why don't we try to publish something, I think. Could you say a few words about that and about the main standard? Sure, sure. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, all of our poets, all of the guests. I can't believe how far flung some of our guests are. I'm reading the chat here and there. So, wow, amazing. Um, I have written for Down East and Roman and Littlefield publishers. Um, I've written for them several times in different, um, you know, nonfiction and, um, yeah, biographies, things that I've written for them. And so I had a book that was being republished, a guidebook that was being republished, and I was given a new editor, Michael Steer. And that was in 2012. So I've been working with him on and off since 2012. And um, I got, I have a contract for a novel, Grey Ledges, that will come out next year. And in the process of doing revisions and talking to him and having meetings, I had mentioned that I'm meeting with this group of nine poets and, and um, you just, I don't, I don't even remember. It was over a series of conversations and I said something like, oh, it would be so great to, you know, to have our work published or, you know, do a collection or something like that. I said, do you ever do that? And he said, oh, well, we've got a new publication coming out, the main standard. And so this was, la I think it's been more than a year ago, right? This is, I, I couldn't even tell you, you guys can probably, uh, do you know when it was? Or it's at least at least a year, maybe fifteen months ago. So it it certainly was over time. We I pitched that idea. He liked it. Yes, the main standard will accept. Then it was everyone um, sent in. I think he asked for you know a number of different poems and that they would choose three. And um, yeah, and so here we are publishing a, a collection and, and we were really excited. Meg and I just had a conversation one day about, you know, how are we gonna, how, what are we gonna call it? And what's it gonna be? And, and, and she kept saying, well, Richard, you know, is always talking about the obsessions. And I said, well, there's the title. I mean, it's perfect, <laughs> so, very catchy. So um, I, that's, that's all I remember. If anybody else wants to chime in, there's one to add. Well, I I also wanted to ask Susan if you would talk a little bit by why you believe this group, you know, came together the way it did and has stuck together the way it has. Well, I think, you know, when the pandemic began, 
um, I know personally, uh, I was looking for connection and, and a community um, that was a little different than the theater community because theater had stopped. And uh, I had had an opportunity to take a workshop with Richard in person in 2019. So when I saw that he was doing a weekend workshop online, I immediately signed up. And that is how I found out about the chapbook uh, workshop that he was going to be conducting. And so I, I joined that workshop. And um, Richard had an incredible way of, of instilling community amongst all of us. It was a very um, structured, craft-oriented workshop. And I feel like we were all feeling a little untethered because of what was happening in the world. And so it was really exciting every two weeks to know that we had to report back and tune in and have something that we have created that existed on the page. And um, then of course we were all opening up our hearts to each other. None of us had met in person. None of us knew each other in person at all. Um, and so that, cumulatively became a very special thing. And we not only got to know each other, well, we really only got to know each other through the workshop, through our work. You know, there was not, in Richard's workshops, there were not, there was not a lot of personal chatter, you know, which was great. Um, we got to know each other as writers. And um, at the very end of the workshop, which was a six month workshop, I felt like he, he really gave us a, a master's degree course, you know, in this. Um, he said, you know, you guys should, you guys should continue to get together, you know, and, and we did. And um, we have indeed stuck. And I think it's because our voices are all very different and we have a lot of respect for each other and we've watched each other just grow and grow and grow incrementally and, and find our voices as writers. Can I jump in? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. If I, can, if I can just jump in, because I think Susan nailed most of it. Um, the accountability piece, I think, is really, really good for me. Um, every month I know that I'm going to see these people who expect that I'm going to come to them with something, that I'm not going to come empty handed. But if I do, they take that too as a sign of um, being a member who is willing to listen and not just read. Um, that's one thing. I also want to mention that since the pandemic, um, for the past two years, Sean has hosted a full day. Um, we do one day during the summer where we spend the entire day together reading, um, doing writing exercises, just really wallowing in, in how much fun it is to be poets. And I I wanted to bring it up because it's really meaningful. You know, I take a lot of workshops and, and often people say, oh, let's get together, you know, or let's keep meeting. And there never has it happened the way it's happened for this group. I saw you wanted to say something, John Paul. Oh, I just wanted to chip in on uh, Chris's comment there that those two times that we've met during the summer are the only time that we've all physically been in the same space. And that really speaks to the power of gathering online, which is also echoed in the Poets Corner as well, Meg. So this community building power is um, really special and thanks for keeping it going in other ways. It, it is unique, I think, and for me, certainly. And there's something also that's happened, and I wonder, JP, if this is something you could talk about a little bit, because there's been an evolution over time of everyone's voices and understanding of each other. Is that yeah. something you feel comfortable talking about? Uh, you know, I can sketch it really quickly, but I think one of the things I would add into uh, what's already been said is that we produced enough work. You know, it was six months and we all produced chat books. So there was a lot of work and we saw growth during that time. Now add two and a half years of, as Chris was saying, coming together every month and having to produce something. 
and we start to see even even greater continuity and growth. And we see the diversity within each other's voices. I think one of the great things about it, as has been mentioned, there's enough diversity in this group. But there's also a lot of overlap, a lot of themes. There's always some kind of connection between the different people. And I, I think that's one of the things that's really strong. You know, actually, if we look at it, the number is perfect. They find that around eight is a perfect group where there's enough diversity within the group, but there are few enough voices that it doesn't splinter into factions. And that, that diversity is very necessary for it to continue to be lively. You don't get into a group think either. So there've been a whole lot of things happening. Mm -hmm. Also, the online thing I think worked better now because of COVID. I think people got used to Zoom. People were hungry for <laughs> that kind of community. And a lot of times people say, well, you know, you, you can't do that on online. And, and we all proved that we could, not just the nine of us, but our culture in general. And so we're more open to that possibility. And it's really made things wonderful. Like somebody was mentioning the international um, uh, attendance here. We've got Ottawa, we've got Switzerland, we've got Kauai. I'm missing a few here. I mean, right now, people are tuning in from all over the world. And that, that's pretty amazing. It is amazing. It's one of the things I really love about the Poets' Corner and the people that have tuned into the Poets' Corner and the way it's brought people together. I was sitting in a workshop last week about submitting your poetry, which was a much smaller group. And I said hello to somebody that I'd known from other groups. And she says, so, you know, I'm here all the time for your events, but you don't see me because there's so many people. So um, if there are people like that that I just haven't acknowledged, it's because I'm just thrilled that there are so many people that have found this as a, a place to listen, to spend some time on a Sunday afternoon and hear some poetry and poets. There, there are a couple of questions and comments in the chat that I'll think I'd go to. Um, one question is, well, wait, let me go to uh, a comment first that was for Lucinda here. And I don't know if you can see the chat, but Maxine is just saying about your, your poem was so raw and filled with vulnerability, it brought tears to my eyes. You gave me an amazing illustration of your time in Colorado where our paths never crossed till I came to Maine. Your words are filled with a beauty that touched my heart and soul. And that, that you know, the fact that a poem makes that connection is just so important to me. And I think we don't always get a chance for that feedback, do we, Lucinda? No. I mean, thank you, Maxine. I, you know, you write and you get that feedback like that and you you write it for, I wrote that for you, I guess. You know? <laughs> um, I mean, there's no, it has to be said that this opportunity to, as Richard was saying, get out in the field, get it and keep staying out in the field. That's what he said at the very beginning. That's what makes... Up you into developing your poet at, to being refining yourself as a poet but I, it has to be said that the the existence of the poet's corner not only our group but the fact that we have the poet's corner to stay out in the field and all the the ephrastic poetry which you Meg um collaborated with the with um the page gallery and you know that challenge to write that and be challenged. I said, I'm going to do this and I'm going to get, I'm going to get chosen, you know? So it just like pushed me and I did it and I did it again, did it again, did it again. But that's really staying out in the field and to have all these people from afar be there and that we can join you. That's it. That's it. So thank you everyone. And, and our nine poets for, I, I love that word challenge, Lucinda, because that's one of the things this group does for me. It challenges me to make sure I've written at least one poem during the course of the month, that I, I'm willing to be vulnerable and bring it to a group because I know I trust the feedback. 
I trust these other voices in the room because they know my obsessions. They know my work. They know they're not trying to make me, my poem be their way of writing poetry. Their feedback always feels in service of my poem. And that means so much to me. Uh, yeah, Meg, um, can we ask Sean to answer the question for Marie Epley? Because I think it really is hers to answer. I haven't seen it. It says, could okay, you just, I will, you I'll ask the question. Um, yeah, and there were a couple of others in the chat that I would, but I love that you want me to direct this to, to Sean. Could you speak to the typical movement through your monthly meetings? Do you all read, pair up? I guess I'm asking how you make the most of your meeting time, which is a great question for Sean. <laughs> She's our organizer. Um, thank you. I think Meg has, uh, I think we each play different parts in it. And um, from the beginning, um, it was getting an email going to organize us to really get this going. And it took off after I'd say like six months or so. You specifically asked about the actual meeting. So we all come to, we've agreed and it took us quite a few months. We've all agreed that we meet on the third Saturday um, of each month. And like people have shared, sometimes you can make it and sometimes you can't make it. And that's fine. Um, and sometimes you bring a poem um, and, you know, it's like ideal if that's the case. But you can also attend without bringing a poem. And so um, um Audrey one time said, I don't have a poem, but I have a poem by somebody else that I think would be wonderful for this group to hear. And so then we hear new poets or poets that we may not be familiar with. Uh, and then the in terms of who goes first, this is actually adding a little bit of levity to our gatherings. As you can tell, some of these poems are pretty intense, right? And um, it was brought up vulnerable. Meg, you brought up being vulnerable, right? Many of us, with in many of these months, we we like rip open our chests. Here is our heart and soul, right? This is what we're working with. But these are the words that we've got on the page. So help us, help me, you know, make these words mean what I want them to mean or hear what you have to say about them. That's going off on the tangent of great feedback that comes out of this group. But I um, found a call of, call. we call it the spinny wheel, but online it's called the wheel of names. Mm -hmm. And you just write everybody's name in there. And then it's on as a wheel colorful wheel you press the button and it's random whoever gets chosen and here's the little funny part that the <laughs> confetti goes off right someone's name is chosen the confetti goes off the cheering happens and we actually do our own cheering as well not just the um spinning wheel cheering so um that's how we organize it unless of course there's somebody that needs to leave early and then They'll go first. Um, um, but I believe I've encapsulated what how our how our meetings evolved and how they happen. I guess I also want to just say that what what like has inspired this to keep going on, and a few of you have addressed addressed that topic, but for me, I appreciate and value um, everyone's perspectives and feedback. And that goes to the diversity of this group, um, even though um, the diversity within this small group. Um, um, so after every gathering, I come away with a notebook full of, um, in my notebook, full of possible poetic um, exercises because um, 
Susan went to this conference and learned this little exercise, or, you know, Pam was doing this. And that gave me the idea of doing, doing, or Lucinda, that one time when you said, I wanted to just play around with this poem again, you know, I want to bring this poem that we thought had been finished, you know, but no, for Lucinda, it wasn't finished. So the, the idea to me, oh my goodness, I can bring that back, that poem um, can be revised and can be brought back to life and given another shot of um, something to make it better. Um, and that sharing poems um, can be um, um, just, I guess that's it, to make the poem stronger. And I guess that is my obsession that I um, feel that... Um, uh, that's what I've discovered. And, and it's, it sounds, or I know it's a group. There's a wave of this going through the group too. And it's just the idea of getting better, right? I can improve this. I can, I can, um, um, improve it, make it better, grow. It can grow. I can grow as a poet and I'm never going to stop growing as a poet, that kind of theme. I want to add one more thing that I think is so funny when we meet. Oftentimes, it's just really interesting, the serendipity that we will show up with similar topics. Mm. Like We have no idea what the other people have written about. And sometimes four or five of us will have written about something that's you know, completely out of our minds, didn't, whatever. And it that floors me. I think that that's an amazing piece of this group. Are we just so tuned into each other? Or is this like, we're, we're tapping into higher vibrations of the universe? I have no idea. But um, despite the fact that each of us individually has our, our own obsessions and passions and things that we write about, th there is overlap that is... Um, yeah, it's an interweaving, I think, of minds that is really delightful. I have always wanted to be part of a collective. I, I you know, as I teach literature, I think about, you know, Hemingway and, and the lost generation. And, you know, I mean, it's just like, what would it be like to be a Bloom, in Bloomsbury group? We've got nine poets in Maine, you know, here we are. So, I, I mean, we might not be quite that great yet, but we're really we're really doing it and it's work sometimes it is a lot of work and we are having to go back so i the last thing i'd like to add and if anybody can jump off from here is that i'm finding myself i'm a full-time writer anyway and not paid as a full-time anything but it's you know teaching and writing i am just a hundred percent of the time writing i find even after hours at the computer and I take my pen and my pages and I'm writing more, you know, because it's just part of this group to sort of be present with your poet self, your most um, observing, aware, intentional self. And to bring that to to the group, I think is what, what each of us has done. So I know somebody asked earlier what, you know, what keeps it going. I think that's what it is. Everyone is so dedicated to this. So um, we have another question from the chat. So I'll come back to you, Chris, if I could just ask this because mm -hmm. it's addressed directly to me. And it's have any of you worked with forms such as a Sistina that complement the theme of obsession? Mm -hmm. Anybody want to take that? Yeah, I I, mean, um, I published um, a villanelle in the uh, deep water column that uh, the it's not just Portland Press it's the other your, the other paper that comes out up north um, publishes on Sunday and that was a real challenge and I think one of the reasons that the editor liked the poem was that it was a villanelle um, so yeah I, I I do that and I think a lot of us have played with sonnets both traditional sonnets and more contemporary takes on sonnets. So yeah, we do do that. Um, if I could just add one thing about our group, the quality, the quality of the feedback comes a lot from the quality of the poetry. So that if Audrey says something, I'm often like chomping at the bit 
to, to say, well, yeah, I agree with Audrey and here's why. And, and here's a little bit more about it. And somebody else, you know, we're, we're really, we have to limit how, you know, how much time we spend talking about each person's poem because we could literally spend an entire session talking about just one or two poems. So that's the one thing about feedback that's really important is keeping grounded. Um, somebody asked, how do you succeed with nine? And I think one thing that we do is that we give it enough time. So we meet from one to four on a Saturday afternoon, once a month. And so everybody, nobody feels rushed. You know, if we, 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 we talk about a poem until we're done talking about that poem. We've sometimes needed to time it to get done within our amount of time, but usually we don't really have to use a timer. And I think that's one way of succeeding. And I think nine is a fabulous number, actually. It's, as JP was saying earlier, it's enough to have diversity, not too many to need to do break into smaller groups. I would like to say just one other thing. I think that, um, you know, in life you have to show up <laughs> and that's what we're doing with, when we meet together, we, we show up. And I think there've only been really just one or two times where somebody hasn't had a poem. Everyone mm -hmm. has been rising to this occasion these last few years. And I think I, I think that because in Richard's chapbook course, where we all met, he was working a lot on form and talking a lot about different kinds of structures and different kinds of poems and, and how you create form and structure. That was a very big part of, of the workshop. And so we have followed suit in that. I think everybody has brought poems of different forms um, to our gatherings. And it is not a love festival. You know, <laughs> when we give feedback, it's not like, oh, this is beautiful. Oh, this is great. No, very much in keeping with um, Richard's eagle eye in what was working, uh, we learned from that. We learned from being submerged six months with his eagle eye, and we're doing that now with each other. Um, and yeah, I think that's significant. Pam, we haven't heard a lot from you yet, and I, I just wanted to ask because you're a painter as well as a poet you've published your poetry what has this group meant for you particularly in your development as a poet i'm interested in everybody's work in this group and um i also love that we all bring something every month um it's such a big deal there's such faithfulness, if you will. That's an old fashioned word, but we are faithful, aren't we? You know, we show up and we bring poems and we listen to each other and we give feedback. And um, I, it's priceless. It's really priceless. Nice. We lost Chris along the way someplace. I see mm -hmm. she just rejoined us. She might've had some internet problems. Mm -hmm but I think she's back. So Lucas, if you get a chance, if you can find her and spotlight her, that would be great. <laughs> we, can, we can get her voice in there a little bit. Um, but I just wanna encourage, I heard from a bunch of people when we were, when I was putting this out there in the pose corner about questions about how to submit to the main standard, questions about, you know, I, I don't have a writing group or I do have a writing group and things like that. And I think that we've had a chance to talk a lot about what a writing group can mean um, in your development as a writer and how important it can be. I don't have questions. I don't have the answers to the questions about submitting to the main standard. But I do want to take a minute and I'm going to go search it so that I can put a link in the chat 
in case you want to order a copy or 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 send a query to the editors of it. So while I do that, um, if there's anything else one of our poets wants to talk about or share with our audience about um, finding a place to meet. Somebody's asking, it's hard to find a suitable wow. place to meet. Well, we meet on Zoom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, it's interesting because we have all of us in different situations. We've had a couple, in addition to the once a year meetings in person, um, we get together here and there. So some folks are in Camden, some folks, I'm now in Western Maine. I used to be close to Camden. So, you know, it's, 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 such a shifting landscape for us, quite literally. I mean, we're we're um, we do meet in person here and there. Susan is the, the furthest from all of us, and we're so sorry she's <laughs> far south from us, so she doesn't get to come up except once a year when she comes and always guides us. By the way, art informs other art, and so when we get together in person, it's so fun because Susan leads us with dance often um and a prompt so we're all you know we're dancing and it gets us in our bodies and then and then into the work that we're going to do and other prompts in the writing but um yeah so we've done some other shorter um retreats and things like that so you know and and i'm always on the i'm, I'm the scout for places to go so <laughs> but we've gone to some camps we've done um yeah various places Wherever anybody has any housing enough for, for people to sleep, all of us. <laughs> all right, thank you. Well, thank you all. And thank you to our nine poets here for, for doing this reading today, which I really, I love how all these poems really spoke to each other and spoke to, to ideas and concerns and issues that are moving, important, important to the world. There was a comment in the chat, JP, that I saw that you answered about, you know, the the that incredible poem, Raining Birds, and how meaningful that is, and how poetry can speak to that and speak to it in a way that you know, all the information in the world doesn't quite reach the heart mm -hmm. the way. Yeah. I think that's part of it as well. There's an expectation not to keep it light in poetry. And so we're not keeping it light. And we're, we're given permission by the medium itself to get deep. And, and that's really wonderful. This isn't like showing up for some cocktail hour. We're talking <laughs> about things that really matter to each other, to ourselves. We share it with others. There's the vulnerability. So true. Thank you. And thank you. you to everybody who came to listen. And it will, the recording will be on the website. Please come back to hear from Richard Blanco on February 11th. And if you have a chapbook of poems, go to our website to see how to submit to the contest because it's a wonderful contest with an incredible judge at the end of it so thank, thank you Meg. thank you Meg. Good keep talking Good night. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Good night, thank you for being Good with us, us.